Hi, my name is Lisa Richter. I'm Director of Industry Outreach and Growth for CSIA. Welcome to this masterclass. Before we get started, a quick word about CSIA. Probably most of you here today are familiar with the association, but if you are not, all you really need to know is that CSIA's mission is to help SIs build better businesses. How do we do that? Well, for starters, we have a team of volunteer SIs who have crowdsourced a best practices manual to help SIs scale their businesses. In fact, the BP committee just released a beta version of the latest manual, which is 6.0. CSA also offers a certification program and other resources, including professional development, learning from your peers, and access to vetted professional services companies, including insurance, financial, and legal, who understand an SI's unique business needs. For partner members, CSIA, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow your SI programs, understand your customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share your thought leadership. With thousands of qualified suppliers and integrators, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps SIs, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For SIs and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position yourself as a thought leader, and nurture prospects during their complicated buyer's journey. If you are not currently a member, now is a great time to join because dues are prorated to the half the price for the remainder of 2023. Basically, because we're halfway through the year, we're gonna charge you half the dues. Membership provides you and your entire team a full lineup of virtual events and other resources from accounting to sales to operations, 365 days per year. If you are currently a member, thank you. If you wanna just get a flavor of CSA and its members, I encourage you to listen to the Talking Industrial Automation podcast. CSA members talk all things industrial automation, and it's just a great way to hear what your peers are up to. One last housekeeping note before I turn it over to today's speakers. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. That helps us stay organized. The session is being recorded and you will get a link to the recording in the next day or so. At this time, I would like to turn it over to today's speakers. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is James Ricker, and I am your moderator for today's event. I am the Director of Industrial Sales for Graybar Electric, handling our St. Louis district, which covers much of the central U.S., and today I have the honor of moderating the panel of industry experts covering the benefits, applications, and insights around universal automation. We'll be covering the enhanced innovation and performance that this provides through hardware agnostic software applications. Before we get started on the panel discussion, I wanted to take a brief moment to provide an overview of Graybar Electric. Graybar is a leading North American distributor of industrial automation, electrical, communications, and data networking products. And we are a provider of supply chain management and logistics services across the country. We have a network of over 325 locations across the US and Canada, supporting more than 146,000 customers. I am part of our industrial business unit that works with manufacturers, OEMs, and control systems integrators. And we have a strong team across the country focused on industrial automation applications and control systems integrators are a key partner in implementing these solutions. So Graybar joined CSIA two and a half years ago. And I have to say, I've been so impressed with the tools, the thought leadership and the resources they provide to the integrator community to help improve the business and the industry and help us address evolving trends in the marketplace. Um, this is our third time presenting, and uh, again, been very impressed. Uh, if you are not a member, as Lisa mentioned, uh, please take time to research it. The, the SI community, the certification process is best in class. Uh, so with that, I would like to take a moment to uh, introduce the panel experts. John, I'll pass it to you first. Yes, hello, hi everybody. John Conway. I'm the president of universalautomation.org, and I'll be talking more about that this morning, explaining what that is. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here today. Good morning, my name is Russell Warren. I'm a sales engineer at Graybar Electric for the past 17 years, and I specialize in industrial automation and multiple market segments. And Ravi, I'll pass it to you next. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Ravi Jagasya here from Artstal. We are part of the founding members of Universal Automation and glad to be on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. John, let me start the conversation with you. Universalautomation.org is described as the missing link to Industry 4.0. Can you tell us more about this? Sure. So Industry 4.0, um, that's the term we use a lot in, in Europe. In, in, in North America, you talk more about industrial IoT. I mean, call it what you want. Digital transformation is a very popular term for that now. At the end of the day, what is it? It's about how do we um, couple the automation systems to the to other systems in the enterprise to achieve uh, the aims to be more efficient, to have more throughput, to be more secure, whatever whatever the aim is. Okay, so how, how you know coupling automation systems with other systems to to achieve some objective. Now, now one of the issues with that is traditional automation systems. Uh, first of all, we can do that, and, and I'm sure you're, you're all doing that, but it's not so easy to do that, okay? Automation systems are great for real-time control. They're not so good at actually connecting uh, connecting and sending data to, to the other systems, whether it's an analytics tool or a simulation tool or whatever that is, okay? That's the first issue. The second issue, it's... More and more, we'll be writing software, okay, which is great, which is great for system integrators because that's your business. Um, but one of the issues we have is, we, for example, if I'm writing some software to connect a machine to a, a simulation tool from a from a company, let's say from Dassault Systems, for example, to do a digital twin, unless I write the software on my Rockwell PLC, if I then want to do that same digital twin on a Siemens P PLC or on a Schneider PLC, I've got to I've got to rewrite the software, okay. Uh, and that, frankly speaking, in you know, in the 21st century, that's that's it shouldn't be that way. The software should be independent of the hardware in which it executes, and I should be able to create reasonable software components. Okay, so so that's 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 why universalautomation.org was created to to actually to to if you like, it's the next evolution of automation systems, making it easier to couple the automation systems with IT systems and to create libraries of reusable software components, be much more efficient in engineering, okay? Jim, you're, you're on mute, I can't hear the question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Always have technical difficulties. Um, so thank you, John. Uh, can you describe what uh, universalautomation.org is with a little more detail? Sure. So it was started about uh, in the in the in the late 2020. There were some discussions between about 20 different companies about setting up a this organization to um, to work on next generation automation systems. And after that, nine months of um, of, uh, of of discussions and working groups to set this universal automation org up, we, we filed for incorporation in the summer of 2021. And we received the um, the incorporation in November 2021. So we've been up and running since November 2021. That's about a year and a half. Universal Automation Org. It's a non-profit association. Okay, it has members from the user community and the vendor community. Um, and what these members do is together they manage a shared source implementation of 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 a technology based on an IEC standard, the IEC 64099 standard. Okay. And without going into a lot of detail, this technology based on IEC 6.99, it enables what I said earlier, that making it easier to connect automation systems to, to other systems, and also to create libraries of true software components in, in the IT center. So universalautomation.org, it's, it's not promoting the IEC 6.49 standard, it's actually promoting an implementation of the standard, okay? So essentially members, they, 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 they manage this implementation with a shared source approach. You have to be a member to get access to it. Then the members, they take the source code, they put the runtime on a platform and they release an offer. And then user members then, then do projects using the, uh, using the, uh, the universal automation compliant, um, compliant software, okay? Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this for two reasons. One is we want to drive adoption of this new technology quickly. So that's why we're taking this 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 uh, this approach of universalautomation.org with a shared source runtime but also fundamentally we're very serious about portability of software components software components that are that are really hardware independent that will run on different uh, vendor platforms okay 
And by having a common, a common runtime execution engine managed by its members, that will go a long, long way to guaranteeing portability of software components across different platforms, okay? Now we've been up and running since since um, since uh, November 2021. We were set up with nine founding members, and Star Star was one of the founding members. Today we're 40 members. A year and a half later, we're 40 members. There's there's five to six offers available that you can that you can use uh, this universal automation technology. So there's offers. There's the first offer was from Schneider Electric, who were kind of one of the the, the, the main drivers behind setting this whole thing up. They launched their EcoStructure Automation Expert offer in, in a couple of years ago now. Um, and, and at the same time, the runtime engine inside the EcoStructure Automation Expert, that is the universal automation.org uh, runtime execution engine. And since November, five other members have taken that runtime engine and ported that onto their, onto, onto their platforms and released an offer. And Star, for example, is one of the companies that's done that and, and, and Ravi will We'll talk a little more about that, okay? So, so in summary, um, 40 members, five to six offers, that's gonna double this year, end of the year, we should be up to 10 offers. Um, we're executing projects with this technology as we speak. Uh, we just commissioned a project in Italy that was using uh, Star Electric Altivar drives with the runtime embedded inside, Stahl controllers to control the, um, it's a pet recycling project so using microwave reactors and, and the Stahl ATEX IO are controlling those reactors. And there was an, um, an Ethercat-based IPC from an Italian company called ESA, who's also a member, doing some number crunching and, and, and IT intensive um, part of the application, okay? And that, that system was commissioned last month and is, is up and running. And there's other projects ongoing, okay? Thank you. It, it, it's amazing to see the growth that you've seen since 2021. Uh, Graybar is also a, a proud member of universalautomation.org, um, and it, excited to see the growth continue. Uh, Ravi, I'd like to pivot to you. Uh, as you mentioned, um, our stall was one of the founding members of Universal Automation. Uh, I'd like to get from, from in your insight, what was the driving factor for you to join universalautomation.org, and, and what, what value do you see for, for your organization? Thank you, James. Basically, Stahl is a manufacturer of remote IOs, remote IOs for the hazardous, or as we hear in the US, call it as classified areas. Uh, these have been so-called open systems, or I would put it standard communication protocols, and been able to interface with most of all the PLC and DCS systems. Over the last 30 years, we have understood that there is a lot of room where people or DCS or control system vendors could customize their versions. And that makes uh, integration a big challenge for integrators and for end users. By embedding the UAO, the 61499 runtime in our IO, we make it appear in the control system uh, environment, in the IDE, uh, a very transparent and easy integration. And it is as simple as a plug and play uh, element. And then you don't need any special drivers or even any customized interfaces. So that is a very, very easy integration uh, solution. And then the architecture is flexible uh, with the 1499 distributed architecture. You can also add some additional functionalities in these individual IO islands. The good part of the whole uh, solution with 1499 is a real time, right time capabilities of the 1499, which even allows us to implement IIoT functions into the IO devices and allows our customers and the ecosystem customers to have digitalization in hazardous areas. This is where we saw the value and that's how Stahl joined or got into the universal automation. Great, thank James. you, Ravi. And, and Russell, uh, I'd like to hear from you um, for, for Graybar and distributors like Graybar, uh, what drove uh, you to be uh, a member and, and what value do you see for distributors like our organization? Um, 
you know, just like our systems integrators partners, as a distributor, we're trying to promote and work with multiple vendors. Um, and a lot of times under the current control environment, we pretty much find ourselves locked into particular solutions. And that could be based on the end user training, um, approved vendor list comes up quite a bit, um, and a lot of legacy installations out there limit, um, you know, what we're going to do. We're not always able to bring what could be the best software or the best hardware to the table because of the very dependent relationship between those two factors. So even with a single vendor, um, sometimes a small discrete controller and a large process control system could still have separate software environments with almost little or no commonality between them. So we see universal automation as a way to start promoting the best software and hardware no matter what vendor is going to be providing it. Um, we have the ability to work with our customers using one or multiple vendors, which is, um, to be honest, something kind of new for us. Also, from the software-only standpoint, I've been working with IEC 61499 for a couple of years now, um, since it was um, initially implemented for the United States. And I honestly find it to be the easiest and most powerful programming environment I've used. Great to hear, thank you. And a quick plug to that, uh, that demo behind you, I believe that's running on uh, IE6 1499 as well, is that correct? That's correct. All the equipment behind me are different vendors, controllers that are running all on the uh, universal runtime engine. That's awesome. Uh, the IEC 61499 standard seems to be a key ingredient to universal automation. John, can you tell us more about it? Sure. Let's, um, if I try and keep it as simple as possible, the, well, first of all, let me say that the 6.99 standard was written by pretty much the same people that created the 61131 standard, which is very well known in, in the PLC industry. But whereas the 61131 is a programming language, okay, um, defining five different languages, 64099 is different. It's actually, a, it's more of a system design language for distributed automation and, and information systems, okay? Uh, and um, the basic building block of 64099 is the event-driven function block. So you have you have function blocks like we have in PLCs, uh, um, but instead of having just data in and data out, you also have an event in and event out, okay? So essentially you trigger an event on an input, the block reads the data into the, into the, into the block, there's a state machine inside, uh, with algorithms based on different states. So when I, you know, I trigger an event, read the data, run my algorithm, and write the result, the data outputs, and set an event, okay? Um, and I, I program by connecting together these event-driven uh, these event -driven function blocks, okay? Now, what's important to know about these event-driven function blocks, they're graphical function blocks, just like in the automation world, but they're also, they're true software components in the IT sense. They're standalone, the, the only way to exercise, to use a function block is via the event data interface, okay? So essentially these blocks, these, they're basically software components. So you know, I could use these as black boxes. I don't actually need to know how, you know, how the block works. I just need to know what it does, okay? So that's, that's the fundamental building block, this fundamentally object-oriented graphical function blocker. Now, the second thing the standard does is it goes to great lengths to separate the um, application from the device on which the application executes. So there's an application model that explains uh, the rules to create an application. So I, as I said, I, I create networks of function blocks by linking them together. I can nest blocks inside blocks, as you, know, as, as you can do in, the, in the, the normal function block language. Um, but this is all done completely independently of the hardware on which it executes. Then the device model defines the, the resources on which my application will execute. And then there's a system model that says, okay, the application is complete. I now want, now want to deploy it to my hardware. And the system model takes the, uh, the, the application, splits it up into small pieces and sends it to the different controllers and, and then automatically recreates the communication across the network. And that's, that's, actually quite easy because this event data construct is you I can cut that between two blocks and reconstruct it over the network it's really not so difficult huh? 
So, so in a nutshell, IEC 6.99, it's, it's graphical software components, event-driven, that are truly vendor independent, okay? That I can plug together to build an application and then deploy to my hardware of choice. And my hardware could be classical, you know, 10 PLCs. It could be one powerful edge computer. It could be a mixture of edge compute devices and PLCs. That's simply a design choice, okay? So, so it's, it's, it's literally a 15 minute job to redeploy the application to a different architecture, okay? So, so, so that's, that's what 6.99 is, a graphical language for, the, for, for, for creating libraries of, of hardware independent software components that I can plug together to build, to build an automation application and then distribute to my architecture. Oh, that's impressive. Thank you, John. So the recently launched Schneider Electric solution based on the IEC 61499 Universal Automation Standard is called Ecostructure Automation Expert, or EAE. And it makes it pretty big. In fact, I would even maybe say huge claim that EAE is hardware independent. Russell, what do we mean by hardware independence? Sure. Um, really what we can claim today is that there is almost entirely hardware dependence in today's automation solutions. And so if I have a software application written for one vendor system, it is not easy and it, it may even be impossible to port that application over to another vendor system. So pretty much in simple terms, if I change from one vendor to another, I got to rewrite, retest and revalidate all the software. So this makes it really costly and difficult for organizations to innovate, make changes, make upgrades, et cetera. Um, any changes they do make are slow and the ability to integrate any new approaches is, is pretty well limited. So now I need to be able to incrementally um, improve my application over time as new things like analytics mature and, you know, I like to reuse the software investments that I've already made, regardless of what vendor platforms I'm choosing. So really what that means is I have to decouple the application software from the underlying hardware. Um, as you mentioned, the first universal automation product is Ecostructure Automation Expert. Um, and it demonstrates that separation quite well. And, and John alluded to it a little bit, but when we say separation, it's really a logical separation. Um, both the program and the hardware are still developed and managed in the same software environment. But the global variable list goes away and um, instead we have these um, items called symbolic links. The links are the key data that needs to be included in the program. Um, but would be derived from a piece of hardware. So usually this is um, instrument data or anything else, um, alarm status, et cetera, that needs to be physically wired to a device. Um, it could also be a virtual piece of data derived from a communication protocol, such as Ethernet IP, OPC UA, EtherCAT, or Modbus, something similar like that. So in the program, we build the application based on the required data or symbolic links that are needed. And when we create our deployment strategy, we actually get to choose the piece of hardware we want that code to run in. And then we make a connection to the hardware with our symbolic links. We can actually choose to remap the program to multiple or different pieces of hardware anytime we choose. And the benefit here is that a systems integrator can write code just once and they don't have to rewrite the same code each time you're changing from platform to platform. So you can save money by using existing software components on multiple projects. Um, you can even encapsulate your intellectual property into reusable software libraries and have an option to sell those components, um, which could potentially open up a new business model. Um, for our vendors specifically, they can now focus on building the best hardware um, without having to focus on building a complete software environment to go with and you know something they may not be experts in. That's great. Thank you, Russell. Um, John, are there other vendors that are building out portfolios of products uh, to support universal automation today? Yeah, sure. As I, as I, as I said, um, as I said earlier, we basically, um, style is a very good example. Um, since we created universal automation a year and a half ago, we essentially have five vendors plus style electric. So I guess that's six vendors 
uh, that have offers that you could test this techno technology on, okay? Companies like Star, Advantec, um, have an Italian company called ESA. Um, we have a, a ship builder, a, 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 a company called Consberg Maritime that builds ships and offshore platforms they actually have their own control system for this. And they're using the 64099 technology as I would call it a, an application orchestrator. So they're actually, it sits on top of the existing controllers. It gets data from the different controllers, does calculations, sends that data elsewhere, displays the alarms and the information to the operator. So it's like an additional layer of control on top of you know, existing legacy-based controllers. So, so yeah, we have essentially six offers that you can test technology on today, and we have other offers being worked on as we speak. Um, so, so by the end of this year, we the plan is to have ten offers in total on the market um, to make this uh, technology um, available and a reality. Okay, so again, it's this. This approach of using a, a reference implementation is a very efficient and effective approach because um, essentially when a vendor joins the organization, literally in months, he can, if he's using a controller with a standard operating system like Linux, for example, which is probably more and more popular, literally in a matter, in a month, he can have a prototype and in six months, he can have an offer launched on the market. So it's a very efficient way to, um, to, to you know, drive this adoption of this technology into the marketplace. Huh? So yeah, six offers, we're going to have 10 by the end of the year. Um, we, we have 40 members currently in total. And as, as I said, we're executing projects. So ExxonMobil is doing a DCS, is placing a DCS with an OPATH based system based on the universal automation runtime. And as I said earlier, I think I mentioned, we, we just commissioned an actual multi-vendor project uh, in, 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 in Italy. It's a pet plastic recycling plant using microwave, a new technology based on microwaves. The reason they chose 4099, the actual reason, the fundamental reason was their, their technology is, um, is based on these microwave reactors and they ramp up by production by adding reactors. You know, so if I need, you know, if I have two reactors and I need a double production, I add another two reactors. And so the mechanical and electrical systems are modular. They wanted the control system to be modular. And again, 64099, object orientation, event driven, you can build modular control systems where literally the control itself is modular, like the mechanical and the electrical. So I don't have to rewrite the program when I add modules, I just add an additional software component. And if I've designed it properly, I literally plug the software component in and it functions. So that, that was their main driver, this mod, the modular, the, the modular the ability to design modular control systems, modular software. Actually, they had another, another advantage they had in, in the current time, and I, I'm sure you all know about how it's tough to get hold of equipment right now with supply chain issues. The, the flexibility on, on selecting the hardware vendor gave them a bit of, gave them a bit of choice. They could actually um, be more flexible on, on which equipment they used to actually implement the project. So, so they had quite a tight timeline. Their initial equipment, they couldn't get it on time, but they could switch to a different supplier and take out the equipment. So that, that was an interesting, an interesting side effect of this uh, vendor independence. Huh? Yeah, John, thank you. Especially coming out of all, all the supply chain challenges we've been facing uh, across the globe for every vendor to have a product agnostic platform uh, really speeds time to market. And that's exciting to see. Uh, Ravi, I'd like to pivot to you and, and uh, learn a little more about how Stahl implemented the universal automation runtime in your ATEX remote I.O. systems. Can you expand on that? Yeah, sure, James. Uh, basically, Stahl is a hardware vendor, and uh, we are limited to only developing the required firmware for our hardware to be feasible, to be able to communicate in the hazardous areas, to be able to interface with other control system vendors. If we would have got into developing and building a 6-1499 system, excuse me there, I, because of extensively working with uh, 1499 systems, I tend to shorten the whole thing and not say IEC 61499. Uh, so uh, being uh, our core competence in communication interface, the required firmware and specifically explosion protection. Uh, we really did not venture out in trying to do any of this development. Uh, Universal Automation provided us an opportunity that reduced our risk of implementation 
and using this reference implementation we could put the new uh, runtime the runtime into our io systems we had recently upgraded our cpus our communication processing unit previously but now with the intelligence of uh, universal automation uh, been able to uh, work as a uh, as a local sub uh, device and in addition to that we were able to uh, simplify this integration and testing with our cpu additionally we also build up the io data and the interface to the runtime the universal automation runtime has been designed to make this very easy it uses a technique called hardware cats which is composite automation type universal automation trained us how to do this and we have completed this so going forward it definitely seems that it is an easy and a straightforward task to create our universal automation offer using our is1 remote io going uh, further as john has already alluded to that we did implement these prototypes uh with the gr3n project uh, the pet recycling project and uh, we were able to implement the uao uh, runtime in our is1 with a hazardous area installation which yes uh, was atx based but the hardware is atx icx and nec so for sure it would be also possible to translate those successes into the us market and more importantly we do see in future a lot of elements that could be added on because the universal automation runtime is flexible we could include enhanced diagnostics predictive maintenance heart integration so that's the work planned out for us going forward and we would be ready with uh, solutions uh, covering is1 plus with universal automation uh, we are ready now for the prototypes and uh, we are ready to support all the test beds which are implementing 1499 just like again john mentioned about the exon mobile one there are a couple of others that we have been working with so happy to help any system integrator implement this test beds on the or with their customers Thank you, James. Thanks, Ravi. That that's exciting to see the progress and some of these large projects and opportunities that are coming out. Um, we also say that these universal automation applications can execute directly in intelligent devices such as drives and also in virtual machines and containerized software environments. How does that work? And also, what is the benefit, Russell? I'd like to pivot to you first. Sure. Um... Well, like John said, the, the runtime provided by UAO can be ported to uh, various devices um, so long as they have enough computing power. And, and really, that's pretty minimal computing power necessary in order to, to use these runtimes. And, you know, it's also can be run in a container just like uh, other pieces of software. Um, Schneider Electric, for instance, first launched uh, the Universal Automation Expert software tool. And additionally, they launched four um, platforms with the Universal Runtime Engine on them. Um, three of those were traditional PLC hardware platforms, um, and they also created a pure software version as well. So they took a typical process controller, which is uh, their M580 series of PLCs, um, and put the runtime engine on that platform using their XID, X80IO. Um, they also put it on a small machine controller, their M251, which runs on their TM3 platform, which is a different IO platform. And one of the most interesting ones was they actually created a controller that um, gets embedded in their Altivar variable frequency drives. So with the drive, I could actually run something, a simple pump station, for instance, um, with one or multiple drives and run all the control algorithms right in the drive itself um, without any need for an extra PLC at all. Um, you know, lastly, they also came out with what they call the soft EPAC or a software version of the controller. Um, and it's it's essentially the same universal automation runtime, but it's packaged inside a Docker container. 
Um, so the soft EPAC, as they call it, can be run on any Linux-based um, edge computing device, all the way up to you know power edge, full servers, um, and control rooms. Um, so really, the main benefit of the universal automation runtime is is its flexibility on the different architectures it can run on. You could run it as a single or hot standby centralized controller in real powerful PLCs or computer platforms. And you can also distribute it to smaller PLC applications or um, even in the future, we believe field devices such as instrumentation. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty simple choice that can be made right at the end of the project. Um, you know, an example that SIs would come across is um, you might run out of computer power when you're developing a project and you might need to either increase the size of the PLC or uh, maybe even add an extra PLC. Um, typically, that's pretty expensive um, to do. It's, it's a major task and uh, it, it's kind of tough to reprogram the application sometimes. But with um, you know, the universal automation and you know the auto, you know, ecostructure automation expert software, um, it honestly is about a 15, 20 minute configure, reconfiguration. And, and uh, you can redeploy down to the to new architecture with the same code you were originally using. Thank you, Russell. Um, which category of members can be part of universalautomation.org and uh, why should a company join UAO? Uh, John, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Um, as I said earlier, we have two basic categories, what I call users. By user, I mean the you know, end user companies like Cargo, like ExxonMobil, but also system integrators, process OEM. So anybody using the technology to deliver an automation system, that's one type of member. And then the second type of member is, is, are the vendors themselves. So someone that, someone that actually wants to take the runtime, embed it in a platform, could be a traditional OT platform like a PLC, but it could be an IT platform. It could be an edge compute device, whatever. Uh, or it could be a smart device. As Schneider has put this inside an Altivar drive, we, you know, other vendors could put this in their drives or, or smart analytics equipment or whatever. Okay, anything with enough compute power to, uh, to run the runtime. Okay, so essentially, users and vendors. We have uh, another category which is universities. We are actually setting up a university plan to, to start uh, training students on this technology, so that universities will start. Uh, producing some engineers that have, have used the 6.99 technology. And of course we have startups, okay? So, so those, I'd say those are the main categories of, of member. Users are really important, okay? Especially the big users, the Cargills, the, uh, the Exxon Mobiles, Nestle is in the process of joining the organization because it's the big users that will drive the bigger vendors to join, okay? And any vendor can join. This is not a, a closed organization. Anybody can join the organization and become a member. You know, uh, John, you brought up a great point on the universities, um, you know, the next generation of engineers that are entering the workforce, uh, they're going to be supporting a variety of different control systems and platforms. I think this, this will be a huge efficiency savings so that they can support agnostic of the hardware that may be installed there today. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's kind of interesting when the, this, te this technology, it's quite different to the way we program today. So it's quite a change in, in programming. But what we've noticed is the young engineers coming out of school that are used to, you know, programming with libraries of components in C++, they pick it up very quickly. And in fact, they, if you put them in front of an 1131 and a 4099 system, within a few seconds, they're like focusing on the 4099 system. It's, it's for them, it's a much more attractive proposition, but they need to be trained and they need, they need to learn automation. So, um, so that's, that's one of our challenges is to, is to create that new generation of, of software engineers for, the, uh, for this technology. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, so our, our time is starting to wind down um, and I wanna make sure we allow some time for questions and answers. Uh, let me ask each of you to provide your perspective on what would make you want to adopt an open automation system as a customer, as an integrator, and what business benefit would you recommend to suggest it to a customer. Uh, John, I'd like to start with you on that. Yeah, let me, I mean, uh, Russell kind of already mentioned this. Um, 
This runtime, this universal automation runtime, users don't buy runtimes. Huh? End users don't buy runtimes. They don't care about the runtime. They're buying a function. They're buying a, a system to to automate their process and, and perhaps do some additional functions on top of existing processes. So, so the value is in the applications that run on the runtime. Okay. So the runtime that we're putting in place, universal automation.org, is just a necessary means to an end. The real value and the real business are the software components, the libraries of software components to build applications. And that, you know, as system integrators, I think they have an enormous value to, to bring to the ecosystem. Because not only, not only do they have expertise in uh, in particular domain areas, so maybe the maybe the, the, the integrator is specialized in a particular in you know in, in food and beverage and has particular knowledge about efficient, you know, cleaning place algorithms. And could potentially develop some components uh, for cleaning place. I'm, you know, I'm just making this up, but they could essentially embed the IP inside software components and then either keep that for themselves just to be more competitive and win more projects, or why not, as Russell says, a new business model actually sell the software components. Okay. Um, there's another area that's very important as well for these software components that's the legacy, the install base. You know, the, the, the factories are full of existing controllers, those controllers aren't going away. We're not going to rip all those out and put the universal automation stuff in. That's not how it works. So essentially, the next 10, 15 years, we're going to have to interface those legacy systems to the, this new way of doing things. And again, that's where system integrators have a key role to play, building software components to manage their, their companies, their, their customers, particular legacy issues, which and every, every user has different legacy and different issues with legacy. And, and system integrators are well-placed to actually build software components to for their for their end user customers to actually uh, wrap those soft those legacy systems and bring it forward to this new way of doing things uh. great thank you uh, russell we'll pivot to you yeah to just um expand on on john's statements you know a, a systems integrator is going to definitely be able to benefit from universal automation by creating basically more refined and higher value programming um you know with the tools they're gonna they're basically gonna be able to use less development tool variations and um allow those tools to work over um, a much wider variety of applications um they're gonna be, be able to bring their customers more value and separate themselves for from those other systems integrators who who aren't adopting the newer technologies um you know, we haven't discussed a lot of the technical details, but there is going to be the possibility of more underlying programming options as well. Um, you know, even though we discussed 61499 as the foundation, within that, you can actually create 61499 objects from other languages. Um, so, for instance, IC61131 structured text, uh, Python, C Sharp, C++, as John mentioned. Um, you know, and and even other languages potentially are either already available or, you know, being considered on the roadmap for um, one or many different products that might be coming to the market. And, uh, you know, lastly, one interesting challenge I was thinking of um, is, you know, everyone faces is how to bring different equipment together. Um, we face it, systems integrators face it on a regular basis. And, you know, oftentimes those projects contain a piece of equipment that is developed by someone else, um, an OEM or a vendor, and they could be using proprietary or different equipment from the main controller that the systems integrator is working with. Um, and I see it with universal automation, it would be less of a challenge because that other vendor could provide the same runtime capabilities. Um, and also they could create a unique um, library that functions for their equipment specifically that could be easily taken by the systems integrator and uh, incorporated into the larger project. That's a great point, Russell. Uh, and, and Robbie, love to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, just adding on to what John and Russell said, uh, portability, application portability is going to make a big difference. And uh, from the perspective that they have developed an application which is in a safe area and tomorrow they want to port it and use an IOs in the hazardous areas in the class and division areas or the zone areas. They could just port the application on using the 
put in uh, 99 runtime and be able to reduce their development efforts and duplicate success much more easier, faster, rather than having to redevelop everything again. Good point, Ravi. Thank you. Um, right. Now let's take time because it is it's 1045 Central. Uh, so let, let's take some time for questions. Um, the first one that came through, John, I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, can Rockwell and or Siemens join universalautomation.org? Sure, Any, anyone can join universalautomation.org. There's no restrictions. Um, and we would welcome Rockwell and Siemens to join. Um, there have been some discussions with Rockwell and Siemens, um, but at this point, no decision has been made for them to join. I think they're waiting to see the, what the market does. Uh, and, and to see if uh, if their customers really start asking for this technology, then that's when they would potentially do something. So 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 for, for us, the key thing to getting those com companies like that on board is to really recruit the big thought leading end user companies, so that so that will create some momentum and and some direction in the marketplace. And that that's part of the universal mission of strategy, which is to knock on the door of the big guys. I mentioned Nestle. Nestle, they're not, they're not yet a member, but they've publicly gone on record saying that they, 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 would, they, they are going to join. It's just a question of going through the paperwork and the legal, the legal, the legal documents. Um, but that, that's what we need. We need some large thought leading companies. The large thought leading, thought leading companies, they need system integrators on board that know the technology and can provide them with solutions. And if we can create this momentum, and start, you know, getting broader support at the hardware level, getting software component libraries being established and used. Then, then I, at some point in time, the bigger vendors um, would have to seriously take a look at this, and and, and of course, they're welcome to join anytime they'd like to join. Huh? Thank you, John. Yeah, it, it, when you get into those large thought leading organizations that have plants across the globe, you know, that have different infrastructures, different ages, being able to standardize and create a seamless platform, there's such benefit. So I, I can see why more companies are, are starting to join and adopt the universalautomation.org principles. Um, are there other end user members that have joined or of note? I know you've covered a few of those during our discussion today. Well, you have, um, you. I mean, the biggest ones, I mean, the. There's the oil and gas movement because of the, the open process automation forum movement. If, if some of you are familiar with that, if, if you're not, go ahead, go ahead and Google OPAF, Open Process Automation Forum. It's an initiative to, to drive more open DCS systems. So DCS systems are even more closed than, than PLC based system. Um, so Exxon, Shell, they're using the, um, the universal automation runtime and the echo structure automation uh, engineering tool to develop OPATH compliant applications. I mentioned Cargill. Cargill, a very big company, um, pretty much standardized on Siemens, uh, but they have a standardized library and the vision of having a, a, a vendor independent soft, uh, you know, application software library is very, com very, very compelling for Cargill. And so that's why they're one of the, they're one of the early joiners of universal automation. Um, and we have, we have discussions with about, I would say, 10 to 20 companies ongoing as we speak. And I'm hoping in the next month or two, we'll have some 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 more big companies joining. Uh, I'll hope to have that good news in, in this summer, okay? That's great. And uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, to give Graywire a shameless plug, we, we are an active member and proud member to be part of uh, universalautomation.org. Uh, we, we see that directly benefiting our business and our customers and creating a seamless hardware agnostic solution. Um, we are getting close to the top of the hour and I think we've addressed all the, the open questions for now. Um, real briefly wanted to thank all of our, our panelists uh, and as well as CSI and all of their, their members for allowing us today to join and talk about this industry leading initiative and, and technology enhancements. Um, before I pass it back to Lisa, uh, panelists, any closing words on your part you'd like to offer? John, I'll start with you. Hey, I would just say join universalautomation.org, please. That's, that's a push. Uh, <laughs> we need integrators on board, so so, and we already have some integrators on board uh, in North America, but um, we we always looking to recruit more integrators to work work with us. So please, if you're interested, reach out to me. Uh, you've, I think. Uh, 
James has put my contact details in the in the chat, but if, just go on to universalautomation.org on, on the web and you can contact us through our website as well. Okay. I, I have a question, John, button in here, none of my business, but I'm curious how much it costs to join. Did you mention that already? I didn't mention that there's different levels of membership depending on what you want to do and, and, and what you um, whether you want access to the runtime source code itself. But for typically for a system integrator, there's a it's basically cost two k a year. It's, so it's not a very it's not a high cost. It's two k a year. It's prorated, and it's a good deal for system integrators because you get to, your logo gets displayed. You get to come to the meetings and network with the with the end users and learn what the vendors are doing. So 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 for system integrators, it's not a particularly high cost to join uh, and promote your your company and services. Okay. Great, thank you. And uh, Ravi, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, I totally agree with John. The system integrators now have the hardware ready to test out the 1499 in collaboration with their end users, apply them in the test beds, apply them in pilot projects, and then take the technology forward. So I believe we all are ready for them to uh start implementing 1499 and they will see the flexibility of uh working with 1499 rather than proprietary systems thank you thank you ravi and russell we'll close it with you you are mute russell luck you're right my last technical difficulty um, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, contact information is, is listed in the chat. So um, if anyone wants to get more information on the software, the hardware platforms, the technology, um, or how to start getting trained on some of this, um, you know, using some online training tools, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Great. Thank you, Russell. And uh, hopefully I'm sharing my screen for those that, uh, didn't see it in the chat, you can do a, a screen capture now of all of the panelists' uh, contact information as well as myself on the bottom. Um, we're grateful again for the opportunity. And with that, I will stop sharing and, and Lisa, I will pass it back to you. So I'm gonna be kind of mean to you. We didn't see your screen. Can you try again, please? I sure will. Thank there you me. go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you Good did test. it, you passed the test, James. Technology. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the screen. <laughs> awesome. I'm sure everybody's available on LinkedIn as well. And, you know, we'll be able to find it. They can always contact me if they need to get a hold of anybody here. I would be happy to pass that along. So sure. I have some final slides as well. And my colleague, Karina, who is behind the scenes, our, our production manager, is going to pop those up for me. Um, let's Let's see how she does. Oh, she did pretty good. <laughs> On behalf of CSA, I would like to thank our speakers for this informative discussion. And I would also like to thank Gray Bar for sponsoring the event. And of course, thank you for attending. Be sure to bookmark the CSA events calendar so you don't miss any upcoming events. And that's a wrap. Once again, thanks for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>